lesson on authority, we determined, uh, we looked at how we determined authority. We've talked about commands, where God tells us to do something in Scripture. We've talked about approved examples, where we go to Scripture and we find that the church did something, or Christians did something, or God showed us how to do something. And then we have talked about necessary inferences. In other words, where we read scripture, and God doesn't directly say, do this, but by everything that is said, the only conclusion you can draw is that God wants us to do this, or something, or something has to be done. We warn on necessary inferences, they must be necessary. We can infer a lot of things, from a lot of passages, but you could also infer other things from those same passages. So we cannot come along and if we're going to infer two or three things, that's not a necessary inference. And so if if we looked outside last night and it was clear on the ground and woke up this morning and there was a couple centimeters of snow, the necessary inference is it snowed in the middle of the night sometime. It's the only conclusion you can draw. Because otherwise there would be no snow. And so that's the type of thing we're talking about. But we all know from speaking to one another, sometimes we are not explicit. That means we don't give every detail about something we say. For instance, go. The, uh, you're, you're talking to your, maybe your brother, your sister, your child. Go to the store and buy bread. Well, the command is, go to the store. The command is, buy bread. This was specific authority. We were told explicitly to go to the store, and we were told explicitly to buy bread. But what wasn't explicit in that command? We weren't told how to go to the store. Could you walk? Well, maybe some of you live close enough to the store you can walk. Some of you have to drive. Maybe you ride your bike. Maybe you take the bus, the subway, whatever. You weren't told, go drive to the store and buy bread. You were just said, go to the store. You weren't even told what brand of bread or what type of bread. If you were told, go to the store and buy bread, you came home with rye bread, and maybe your mom or dad said, I didn't want rye bread. Well, you just said buy bread. This is my favorite bread. And really, the parent really can't argue that much. They didn't say buy X, Y, or Z bread. They said buy bread. And you came home with bread, and, and so you've obeyed that command. When we, are, when we receive commands that are not explicit, that gets, gives us some choice in the matter what we might call an expedience, a convenient way of obeying what we were told to do. Thus, within that specific authority, go to the store and buy bread, was what we call generic authority, personal choice to decide on, what that, on that which wasn't explicit. If the person had to go to Price Chopper and buy a loaf of their generic brand of white bread, if you were told, go to Price Chopper and only buy the generic brand of white bread, well, that's the only choice you have. You were given a choice maybe how to go to the store, but you were told what store to go to and what bread to buy. We would not get a choice when someone said something explicit, and that's if we want to obey them, that is. And the same is true for the Bible. And that's what we're going to discuss today. Is God always explicit? So let's deal first with the two types of authority we're going to be discussing. And I've already alluded to them. Specific authority. This is the first type of authority. This is when God tells us what to do and how it is to be done. 
For instance, when it comes to the Lord's Supper and unleavened bread, why do we use it? We're going to be talking about the Lord's Supper as our example for most of this lesson today. So uh, we're going to be looking at what's specific about it, what's generic about it. But why do we use unleavened bread? Well, let's go to Luke chapter 22. I'd like us to read the passages that would tell us that Jesus used unleavened bread. Luke 22, we're going to read verse 1, verse 7, and verse 19. Luke 22, beginning at verse 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. Skipping to verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. Skipping to verse 19. And he, being Jesus, took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So what do we learn from this passage? Well, we first learn that the Lord's Supper was instituted, was, was first observed during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And this is where not knowing our Old Testament is going to cause us some difficulty. Because back in Exodus 12, if you were to read that, and you can on your own time, the Hebrews were told during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, before that feast began, you had to clear all the leavening out of your house. There was not to be anything leavened, whether, it, whether it's bread or cakes or even some drinks that might have uh, yeast in it, which is a leavening agent, it was all to be taken out of your house. So, and you were not to eat anything leavened during this feast. And so we find that the Lord's Supper was observed the night Jesus was betrayed during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread because why? Sun had set. The Hebrew day began at sundown, not sunrise. It was what we call Thursday night, but what the Hebrews would have said was Friday night, because their evening and then morning was the first day. So uh, the, the Hebrew day began with the evening, and so since it was evening and the sun had set, this was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and... And so that's the time when the Lord's Supper was instituted. So when verse 19 says that Jesus took bread, the necessary inference is he took unleavened bread because of the time. There is no other conclusion you can draw from that because of the commands found in the Old Testament and how Jesus fulfilled all those commands ex uh, exactly. So thus, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, the bread we use is unleavened because that is the bread Jesus used to represent his body. That is specific authority. God told us what to do and how to do it. We don't have authority to change the type of bread from unleavened to leaven. Some people might say a leavened bread tastes much better. It's much lighter. It's not as dense. You get that all the time at the store. Any, t any bread you buy is likely leavened bread. But we can't come along and say, well, I just like it better. Jesus used unleavened bread to represent his body. We do not have the authority to change the bread to cake or to lamb or to beef. Unleavened bread is what is to be used to remember Jesus' body. Well, what about the day we partake on? If you go to a Catholic Mass, you are going to have what they will call the Eucharist at any Mass that they have, whether that is a Mass on Sunday or Monday or Thursday or Saturday. It's all If it is a Mass, it is going to have the Eucharist there. Do the Scriptures tell us what day to partake? Well, you might say, well, the Lord's Supper was instituted at Passover, Days of Unleavened Bread. Is that specific authority as to when to partake of it? And, you know, the answer is it could be. It may be Jesus only wanted us to partake of the Lord's Supper at Passover time. Let's find out. 
by going to Scripture. We go to Acts chapter 20. Verse 7 is the verse we often use to uh, discuss about the first day of the week, but I'd like to back up one verse to verse 6 and then read verse 7 as well. Acts 20, beginning at verse 6. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. The phrase, break bread, when it is used in the context of an assembly of the church, come the coming together of disciples, always means the Lord's Supper. Christians can gather together for a common meal. That's fine. The church doesn't gather for a common meal. So when we see break bread, we are talking about the Lord's Supper. When did this assembly occur? Well, it occurred after the Passover. We know it because verse 6 says so. After the days of unleavened bread. And it occurred on the first day of the week. You look at your calendars. What is the first day of the week on your calendar? It's Sunday. That's the day we call Sunday. We usually call this the weekend. But today is the week beginning. It is not the weekend. And our calendars still say Sunday because that is still the first day of the week. That has been the first day of the week. That is the day Jesus rose from the dead. And so the disciples gathered together to break bread on the first day of the week. This is the day that the disciples always assembled together. Now they could assemble on other days as well. We read of that in Acts 2. They assembled on multiple days. We assemble on other days as well. But disciples always assemble together on the first day of the week. And the Lord's Supper we only find partaken of on the first day of the week. We do not find an example anywhere else. We do not find a command anywhere else. And we do not find a necessary inference anywhere else. So, oh, no, I guess I didn't. I guess I didn't. Uh, I went too far. So this approved example is the specific authority we have for partaking of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. We do not get to change the day. So, again, we have God gives us an example. He shows us what he wants done. And he tells us when to do it. And he gives us the example of when to do it. When did the disciples do it? First day of the week. When do we do it? First day of the week. Can't find another passage where that would say otherwise. You can't go to 1 Corinthians 11 because that doesn't tell us day of the week. Can't go to Matthew 26, Luke 22, Mark 15. Doesn't tell us day of the week. Acts 20 does. That is the example we use. That's specific authority. You got to peek at the next part, which is generic authority. So we have specific authority. God tells us what to do and how to do it. Generic authority is when God tells us we have to do something, but leaves it up to us on how to accomplish that something. When we get a choice, I said earlier, we use something that is known as an expedience. And an expedience is an aid or a convenient way to obey this generic authority. This aid that we use, this expedience, cannot change God's command in any way, or it is not an expedience. We could come along and say, well, it's more expedient for us to use something else on the, uh, on the Lord's table for the bread. It's hard to buy unleavened bread, hard to make unleavened bread. Nobody is a good cook in the congregation. Isn't it just easier to go to the store and buy Wonder Bread, or the cheapest bread on the shelf. Wouldn't that be okay? It's not generic authority. The expedience used was changing God's word. Now, if someone went to the store, it's very easy right now. It's Passover time. It's very easy to walk into Walmart and, and other stores and find unleavened bread, because the Jews require that for Passover. 
Would it be wrong to go to the store and pick up some of that? No. That's an expedience because it's assisting us in, in obeying the command. So an expedience cannot change the command, and it also cannot be bound as the only way of doing something. Because remember, generic authority involves choice. If I get a choice, I can't come along and say, my choice, therefore, is the only choice. No one can do that. If I give you choice, you really do get choice. Some expedients might be better than others. Some might be more expedient. So in other words, it's an expedient to have a building. But if the church is for people, is it really the best expedience to have a building that you have to pay a lot of money to rent? Or might it be better to meet in someone's home hopefully grow, and then find a place to meet. That's something for the church to consider. I'm not saying one is wrong and the other is not, because it's not. But some expedience might be better. But an expedience cannot, I cannot find an expedience, a choice, on someone else. So if one church has four songs, and this congregation is about to have five and then six, and we go to another congregation, we go to West End, well, East End has six songs, you have to have six songs. Where in Scripture does it say that? The command is to sing. How many songs? That's the expedience. I can't bind on West End what we do here at East End when it comes to generic authority. So let's go back to the Lord's Supper. What is the generic authority for the Lord's Supper? Well, First of all, I ask the question, how many pieces of unleavened bread do we use? Today, there were two trays, and there are two pieces. Naomi's the one who makes it, and you get two circular pieces that she makes. That's enough for everyone in the congregation. Now, if you have a larger congregation, you might have three, four, five, depending on how big the congregation is. You could have many more, many more than that. Is how many pieces of unleavened bread important? Do we get a choice on that? Let's go to Scripture. In Luke chapter 22, in verse 19, and we've already read this, but let's read it again. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. How many pieces of bread did Jesus use? And if we're being honest, we have to say, I do not know. Bread is both singular and plural. We don't say, go get the breads. That's not how we do it in English. We say, go get the bread. The bread could have 10, 12, 14 pieces. It's still the bread. And so if we're really being honest, I can't say Jesus used one, two, three, or whatever. What I can say is, uh, is that there was enough bread for everyone. That's what I can say. There are some who insist that, well, Jesus only had one body, therefore he only used one loaf. That's an inference. I, Jesus did only have one body. Can't deny that. That's an inference to come along and say, well, then Jesus must have used one loaf. But that's not a necessary inference. It's just an inference. You can come along and say, well, he could have used two or three or four. The passage doesn't say Jesus used only one loaf. The bread as the whole represented his body. Just as the church has many members and is one church, you could have multiple pieces of bread and be described as one bread. Thus, the church has generic authority to use as much bread so that everyone can partake. That is an expedience. And I'd like to illustrate this. People say, well, you go off and you make such an extreme example. This isn't an extreme example. Because it's an example that actually happened. 
the church in Acts chapter 2, how many people were present? Well, we know in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 Christians or people became Christians. 3,000. Did the disciples make one giant loaf of bread so that everyone could partake? Now, that would be a sight to see. One giant loaf coming into the temple grounds is, is like, is, what are you doing? People might say, what are you doing? Oh, this is one bread. We have to have one bread. No, I don't believe that's what they did. They had enough bread so everyone could eat. That's the generic authority. Unleavened bread, specific. How many pieces of it, generic? How many cups do we use for the grape juice? There were 30 put out today because I put 30 on the, on the chart at the back. So we used 30 cups today. How many cups did Jesus use? Let's go to Luke 22. Luke 22, verses 17 and 18, and then verse 20. Luke 22, 17. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Verse 20. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. First of all, we find the cup contained the fruit of the vine, which in, in, in Palestine meant it, it was grape juice. That's specific authority. That's our unleavened bread for the, for the, fruit, for the grape juice side of the Lord's Supper. We have to use grape juice. But the cup was divided among the disciples so that all could have some grape juice. I do not have to wonder. It says that, and it says that the cup was divided before Jesus began the Lord's Supper. He said, take this cup and divide it. And then you get to the part where he said, this bread which I take is that's broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. The Lord's Supper hadn't began yet. And Jesus had already divided the cup. All the disciples had grape juice. Therefore, we have generic authority to use divided cups for grape juice so that everyone could partake. That is an expedience. Now, some insist on one cup, saying that the cup itself represents the new cup. They say the, the blood represents the forgiveness of sins, the shedding of blood, the forgiveness of sins, but the cup itself represents the new covenant. If you've ever met a church that believes in one cup alone as the only way to partake of the Lord's Supper, and you ask, why, do you, why is the cup important? They're going to say, it's because it represents the new covenant. Now, let me ask you. Bill talked about the new covenant and the old covenant in class this morning. The new covenant came and Jesus fulfilled the old and brought in the new. When it came to that old covenant, was the covenant sealed and represented by a physical object like the book of the law? Let's go back to Exodus 24 and read verses 6 to 8. You'll notice that this passage in Exodus is very similar to what Jesus told us in Luke 22. Exodus 24, verses 6 to 8. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the law, or sorry, the book of the covenant, and read, in the hearing, read it in the hearing of all the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. The covenant here was sealed by the blood of the lamb that was slain. It was not sealed or represented by the book of the covenant, the law. It was sealed by the blood. The new covenant which came in and replaced the old covenant was sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it is the grape juice, that 
which is contained in the cup that represents the blood of the covenant. It's not the cup itself. Moreover, by the, by the time that Jesus said this cup is the new covenant in my blood, as I said earlier, it had already been divided, showing us that the cup symbolizes nothing. In truth, cup in English is what we call a metonymy. A metonymy, uh, 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 so, yeah, it's a metonymy. A metonymy is a figure of speech consisting of the use of the name of one thing for that of another, of which, uh, of which uh, it is an attribute or associated with it. For example, we say that the land, this is true in Canada, that there are certain lands that belong to the crown. What do we mean by that? Do we mean that there is a physical crown that owns land? No. We understand that the crown represents lands belonging to a king or a queen who wears the crown. So the crown is a physical thing that represents the whole. The cup here represents what is contained in it, which is, the, which is grape juice, which represents the blood of the Lamb of God. So that's generic authority. Examples of generic authority when it comes to the Lord's Supper. Quickly, what are some other examples? Well, first of all, we have singing. In Ephesians 5.19, singing, making melody in your hearts to the Lord. That's specific authority. Singing, making melody in your hearts. That's why we don't have an instrument. Why we don't have drums. Uh, we don't have guitars. We don't have... Uh, we don't have... Um, Pianos, organs. Uh, that's why it was so hard to make these books, because a lot of churches have those, so they don't print the music. They just print the words, and they'll have the organist play the tune, and everyone follows the tune with the words in front of them. We don't have that, so we do need the music. But we can't make the music from an instrument. It has to come from the heart. How many songs, though, is up to us. There was a point in time we sang one song. Then we came up to two songs, then three, then four. Next week we'll start with five. We used to sing six, and we'll get back to that. Each church is different because how many songs is not specified in Scripture. Even using songbooks is not specified. If we memorized every song, maybe we wouldn't need a songbook. However, there are people coming from different countries who don't sing the same songs. They know some, most of the songs we sing. But they, they would have different songs, maybe in their own languages. Not every song translates into every language as nicely. They'll have their own songs. So we have a songbook. Why? As an aid to assist in singing. It doesn't change our singing. The melody doesn't come from the pages. It comes from us. The, word, the, the, the song itself is the words on the page, and we sing it. That's generic authority. Specific singing from the heart, generic, the use of songs, uh, the use of songbooks, and how many songs. Meeting on Sunday. We discussed that the church meets on Sunday from Acts 20, verse 7. That's specific authority, first day of the week. However, what time of day do we meet? This church meets at 10 for Bible study, and 11 for assembled worship. We met during the early days of the pandemic at 9 and 10, and then 1 and 2, because we had to split up the congregation to meet the regulations of the government here. And so uh, we had, really, two separate services, four different sessions. It's the same session for both. Those were our times of meeting. It was all on Sunday. But those were our times of meeting. Go to another congregation. West End, I think, meets at 1015 for Bible study. Every congregation might be different. You go to the States, might be 930, might be 9. Some might meet twice on Sunday in an afternoon service at 5. Why, do, why can we do that? Because the time of day is generic. Whether we use chairs. Uh, sometimes people who like to attack authority, where do you get chairs? But where do you get the authority to have chairs? God's not explicit on that. He said, meet. Well, could we sit on the ground? Yes, we could. 
in some places. You go to some countries and they do. Nothing wrong with sitting on the ground. Some of our elderly might have trouble getting up from sitting on the ground, but it's an expedience to have chairs. We can do that because that's part of meeting. What about giving on Sunday? 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 is very specific on that we give on the first day of the week as we have been prospered, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's 1 Corinthians 16 and 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So when we collect, that specific. How we give, that specific. Like as far as in what attitude we give. But four years ago, we used to pass around a plate, a couple of them. And people would give that way. And a lot of congregations do that. We don't do that. The pandemic changed uh, the way we give, but I had wanted to do what we do for the longest time, but I wasn't going to rock the boat. We needed to study on it first to ensure that everyone was in agreement. The giving at the back in the box was also an expedient, that what we were using was an expedient way to collect on the first day of the week. Well, the pandemic changed some things, but... Why do we use the box? Why do we continue to use the box? We pass these trays. Why don't we? Why didn't we go back? Well, there were some <clears throat> good reasons as to why we do what we do, so that we do not pressure those who are visiting with us, perhaps, so that we don't, uh, so so that maybe uh, we aren't. Uh, people might not feel if they're not giving on a certain week that. They're being judged for not giving or something. I'm not saying that people would necessarily have that attitude. But there are some reasons why we have continued doing that. It is a convenient way. However, it is not the only way. We can't come along and say, well, no, you have to do it this way. Whether it's you have to pass plates or no, you have to use a box. I like this method a little better. Uh, and uh, it, it does... Uh, comport to scripture in Matthew chapter 6 about giving being done uh, more privately than public giving in that sense. I do like that. But it is not wrong to pass a plate either. And that's the point. How it is collected, that's left to each congregation. So, in answer to the question, no, God isn't always explicit. He does give us some choice. But we have to discern if we have choice. We don't get to just say we have choice because I want to have choice. When we determined that there was generic authority, what did we do? We went to the scriptures and discerned it. I don't have generic authority without going to the scriptures to find it. I still have to go to the scriptures. If I can find a scripture that says, okay, God told me to do something, but didn't tell me how to do it, I have generic authority, within reason, if I use the proper expedience. But if I go to scripture and find, no, this is the only way we can do it, I don't have that choice. I do not rely on silence, as we discussed before. We, that is not authority. God is explicit on how to be saved. He said we need to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. We need to repent of our sins and be baptized for the remission of our sins. And then we need to live faithfully until death. If we do that, we will be saved. We do not get a choice. Baptism is immersion in water. I don't get to substitute sprinkling. Repentance is required. I don't get to skip over that part. Faith is required. I don't get to skip over that part either. I must obey everything that God says if I want to be saved. And he is explicit on that. I'm not ashamed to own my voice.